The Last Cigarette by Grea Laspina From Weird Tales Magazine, March 1925 Milton Wheeler's thick-set body shivered as he put a match to the wick of the oil heater, noting mechanically that the reservoir was almost empty. Before he could get more oil, he would have to settle the already large bill owing the grocer. He paced the floor to stir his torpid circulation, rubbing his stubby hands together briskly. His gray suit was much too light for November, and his undergarments, repeatedly darned and patched by Agnes's hand, too thin to yield their original warmth. He owed the tailor for the new black overcoat. As for the underwear, he would first have to pay for last summer's things, and for the new black hat, before ordering other garments. A black suit he had not quite dared to order. Not that the tailor had actually asked for money, but he had observed casually that he wouldn't send his little bill until after the funeral. After the funeral. Milton shivered again, this time not from cold. Everything was coming in after the funeral. He felt that Agnes had dealt him almost a personal blow by dying. Without her cooperation, how could he keep up his pretenses? It would be a few days only before his hated rival would learn upon how small a foundation had been built Milton's house of sham. That Benson, who had in everything but the winning of Agnes triumphed over him, should learn of his failure to make a success financially, was to Milton a frightful tragedy. Milton had had a few thousand dollars in bank, and a fair salary at the laboratory, when he married Agnes, winning her from Benson, who had large private means. It was the first time since the two had been boys in school together that Milton had triumphed over the other man. It had been indescribably galling to him to think that Benson would ever learn how much Agnes had lost in marrying a poorer man. Agnes had rebelled at this deception in the beginning. She did not care, she said. But then she saw how keenly Milton felt about it, how his every thought was turned in the one direction. Poor girl! Her first unkind act had been her desertion of him at this critical moment. Milton had managed to fool everybody. He had kept up a lavish establishment, spending his principal freely. He had bought Agnes everything that could make the impression of unlimited means upon the rejected Benson, whose keen eyes, he fancied, were always upon him. Agnes's death, however, found him penniless, without a position, confronting a mountain of unpaid bills. Rent, unsettled for four months. Groceries. The sum was almost staggering. Butcher, how could they have consumed such quantities of meat? The doctor. Somehow this account had mounted up to much more than Milton had anticipated. There must have been many visits to the office, of which Agnes's husband was ignorant. She must have kept her sickness from him a much longer time than he had realized. To the doctor's statement, Milton had pinned, with sardonic humor, bills from the druggist, the florist, the undertaker. Then there was a coal bill, laundry bills, ice bills. The sum of these items marshaled itself before him with malignant triumph, conveying to his shrinking spirit the overwhelming provision of defeat. Men were being turned away everywhere. He might be months finding another such position as he had been holding for four years. He might raise money to settle the appalling total of the debt by paying the exorbitant interest rate of some loan shark. But even this was to be only a temporary relief. Discovery of his castle of pretense was inevitable, and to him disclosure of the real facts meant such complete, such utter ruin that the bare idea bowed him down into the very dust of humiliation. He could see Benson's smile. There was only one way out. Death. It was distasteful to him, because his death, under present circumstances, would mean the disclosure of what he had for three years been struggling to conceal. 
his death, with the revelation of that appalling sum total of debt, would make him the subject of derision for his rival. If there were only some way to escape without bearing his sordid secret to the world, he whipped his dull mind into unwilling concentration. And then, suddenly, he had it. Within the dusk the little heater cast a circle of friendly radiance. Milton threw a glance upward. The lamp hook in the great beam across the middle of the ceiling looked strong enough. In the laundry there was plenty of good rope. He would bring up a stepladder. Half an hour later he jimmied open from the outside one of the study windows, giving on the garden. The gusty November air swirled into the room, setting the curtains aflutter. Upon the floor under his writing desk he laid a ten-dollar bill, as if it had been accidentally dropped by hurried fingers. The balance of his last week's salary he tore carefully into small bits and burned, scattering the ashes on the night wind from the open window. He pulled out both desk drawers, tossed their contents upon the table and floor as if some unlicensed intruder had gone through them hastily. Upon the bronze tray on his desk he lay a sheet of paper, inscribed with a few terse, carefully thought-out words. He had disposed of all his securities, he wrote, to charities in which he and his wife had been interested, but had left sufficient cash in the desk drawer to settle all outstanding accounts against his estate. He chuckled as he wrote, a humorless sound, and then shrugged his thick shoulders, finished. I cannot live without Agnes. I am going to join her. In those last moments he was capping the edifice of sham with the most marvelous of cupolas. He was putting the finishing touch to a work which for three years had been the driving force in his life. From boyhood he had had the worst of it from Benson, always. Now Benson would be unable to smile in that slow, exasperating way of his. No, Benson would be obliged to think of him with astonished admiration. He felt malicious enjoyment as he surveyed the indications of burglary, and the note that so well covered the traces of his supposed wealth. The fools would believe he had killed himself out of grief at the loss of his wife. They would continue to admire and envy him, and his secret would remain undiscovered. Everything was ready. He lighted a cigarette, contently. When he had finished this last smoke, he would climb the ladder, adjust the rope. It would be the greatest triumph of his life, after all, this death. His only regret was that he could not be there to enjoy the effect of the stupendous climax. His cigarette finished, he flung the butt away and mounted the ladder. He felt gingerly of the rope, knotted around his neck, shuddering involuntarily. If it were not that by dying he was making his secret secure for all time. After all, it was the only way. Setting his teeth, he pushed against the ladder with both feet. It toppled to the floor with a crash. As his body was whirled about by the tautening rope, a flare from the bronze tray on the desk caught Milton's eye. In that last poignant moment he had the mortification of observing that the cigarette butt had fallen upon and ignited the suicide note, that curled, crisped, blackened to an indecipherable ash before his agonized eyes. The End of The Last Cigarette by Greya Laspina